All right, great interview for you guys today. Jamie Cromwell, you know him for all of his roles. I mean, you apparently, I don't know if this is true of my producer or kidding with me, but you have, you're in so many movies that your movies have a Wikipedia page. <laughs> <laughs> so, Babe, Space Cowboys, LA Confidential, The Green Mile, People vs. Larry <laughs> Flint, Spider Man 3, The Artist, uh, and the list goes on and on. Um, and then, let alone every TV show in the world, uh, including one of my favorites, Six Feet Under. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but what people might not know is you're a legendary activist. And so, it's a great pleasure to have you Thank on you. the Young Thanks, Thanks for coming on. My pleasure. I'm delighted to be here. So, uh, Jamie, uh, there's a lot to talk about. There's, mm -hmm. um, we, we have two things in common. Mm -hmm. uh, we've both been arrested for civil disobedience, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we were both in deep impact. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my, small world. <laughs> yeah, it was more my car that was in deep impact <laughs> than me. I, I, was, I was an actor driving one of the cars in the. Key bridge uh, between Washington D.C. Oh. and and and, uh, and Arlington. Well, my part was not very much bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I did get to sit next to uh, Gene Hackman though and eat some uh, peanuts. So, uh, okay, that that was, that was my it. claim to fame. Great. <laughs> <That's> great. <laughs> anyway, so um, let's start at the beginning a little bit, and then I want to work up to you've got a trial. Um, and then waiting for the verdict. Yeah, and waiting for the verdict. Yeah. That's super, super interesting. Yeah. Okay, as part of your civil disobedience. So, first, uh, what what turned you into this huge uh, liberal? Did, were you born a liberal, or <laughs> or did you become one? <laughs> Was there a scarring moment? What happened? I uh, I had been in the theater uh, ten years, uh, and I got in. Involved, uh, actually, no, I should go back. It's earlier than that. I went to uh, England for the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's birth, uh, a, a seminar sponsored by the National Theater. And when I came back, my father had cut a little squib out of the New York Times about a theater that was going to tour the Deep South. Mm -hmm. So I went, he said, why don't you go down that? So I did, and I was hired to direct Waiting for Godot and be in another play, which was Pearly Victorious, and got off the plane in New Orleans went to the house that we were supposed to stay in. On, on the side of the house was a plaque, coloreds only. And I thought, oh wow, that's a throwback to the Civil War. It must be really, went upstairs, met the very nice black lady who showed us to our rooms, went out to dinner with the man who started the theater who was black and promptly got thrown out of the restaurant. I'd never been thrown out of a restaurant before, so I sort of, my, my fist goes like this. And uh -huh. John, uh, the head of the theater said, no, 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 I'll, I'll handle it. Informed the man that he violated his civil rights and that there would be an action. Um, and I thought, well, that's sort of weird. Then we rehearsed the plays and the first place we played was Macomb, Mississippi. And as we entered Mississippi, the church on the side, at its, the side of the church had been firebombed. And I went to the Freedom House and there were more black people than I'd ever seen in my life. And there was a 14 year old girl who was describing how she had been beaten and kicked and spat upon trying to integrate the local um, five and dime uh, counter. I, I had no idea what country I was in. While I was there, a young man that I played football with in high school, Mickey Schwerner was killed along with Cheney and Goodman. We knew they were missing, but I didn't know it was Mickey. Um, they were following us, but they didn't take us seriously. So we played Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, and Georgia, all in black communities. Um, I got chased out of the white community uh, when I tried to <laughs> hand out flyers. Took it to New York. John was arrested um, for, uh, the head of the theater was arrested for uh, um, a violation for not going in for his draft. Um, and my, I was altered, changed. I had seen the courage of the people, um, not only in the Deep South, black people, but also people who came from the rest of the country in addressing a primary issue of somebody's civil rights being violated by a set of laws which were unjust uh, and that this was the way to do it. That one stood up, uh, one took a chance, there, there was a consequence, uh, but ultimately we were gonna win. Unfortunately, we didn't win. Uh, mm -hmm. It just changed into the penal system. Uh, and that began, and then uh, I kept on, I became involved in the Black Panther with the Black Panther, anti-war movement first. 
I was in Washington when we closed down Washington completely. We had 150,000 people on the island just across from the White House. I went to jail uh, for assaulting a police officer. Uh, and my case was dismissed along with everybody else's. But it was a sense that we actually, and we did, we actually stopped the war. They, Nixon said that was the... He looked out and he said, if I continue this, I'll never, I'll lose the American people. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I got involved with the Black Panthers, uh, um, with the, something called the Committee to Defend the Panthers, mm -hmm. uh, which was basically to get the Panther 13 out of jail. Uh, you know, there was a trumped up charges, COINTELPRO. And COINTELPRO was actually assassinating Panthers. They were sending guys in to shoot people in the Freedom Houses, you know, and to try to create dissension between... Uh, Uwe and Bobby and Eldridge. And so there was a meeting in New York, uh, and the Minister of Information, a guy named Big Man, came, stayed in my father and mother's apartment. They were not there. Uh, and then he was uh, taken, he was arrested for possession of a firearm, the Sullivan, uh, breaking the Sullivan law. And I went down to the, um, to the uh, trial, and the district attorney, presented the evidence that he had been apprehended with this handgun, but we all knew that he'd taken out the handgun and handed to a friend of mine who was whose father was in the New York Symphony. And so, uh, oh, what was his name? William Kunstler was the lawyer. And he oh, got yeah. up shrieking, saying, it's a lie, it's a lie. And I'm sitting there as a, as a, a Westchester white boy saying, I don't understand. You mean they lie in court? <laughs> no, I had a similar moment. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't I, believe it. You know why? Because it wasn't in our perspective. When I was growing up in the suburbs in New Jersey, yeah. you know, we we didn't know that the cops lied. We thought the yeah. cops were honest people there to protect us, yeah. right? Yeah. And we didn't think prosecutors lied. And I briefly interned in, in a couple of prosecutors' office, yeah. and then and then come to find out. Yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah, they, they do. do, and unfortunately, quite often. Often, most yeah. of the time. Yeah, not most of the time, but often. So, um, lots of amazing and powerful stories there. But I wanted to ask when when you were telling that story about New Orleans, going down to New Orleans, and then doing the tour of Mississippi, yeah. etc. What year was that? 1963. 1963. So, and then the next year they pass Civil Rights Act, and then yeah. the Voting Rights Act. Yeah. So, at that point, they don't you don't even have the Civil Rights Act when you go down. No, what we had was that. Uh, uh, Johnson called um, the um, governor of Mississippi and said, if this does not stop, this, because Birmingham had, Birmingham had happened, mm -hmm. and Macomb, uh, and he said, if this continues, I will declare martial law in the South, and that will be it. We'll have troops on the street, we'll, and every, everything will change. So they sort of pulled back. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't really hassle us. They couldn't believe any that we we were playing Waiting for Gatto, a very sophisticated uh, uh, piece of theater, to mm -hmm. people who had never seen a television show or a movie, much less a play. And it's amazing. Yeah, and Fannie Lou Hamer got up in Indianola and turned to the audience. You know Fannie Lou Hamer? She was the head of the Mississippi Freedom Delegation that tried to get seated it in 64, and Johnson disallowed them. Mm -hmm. um, it was an integrated um, um, delegation. Yep. And she said, I want you all to listen to this play because we're not like those two guys. We're not waiting for anybody to give us anything. We're taking what we need. So she knew how to contextualize this. And I felt that that was true in almost every performance. I had the best story ever. Uh, I would ask at the end of the play, because I didn't know what people were getting, did a lot of questions about the play. And one of them was, did you think Godot was coming? And this woman in the back, mm -hmm. I think it was Greenville, raised her hand. She had a black glove on. You know, they wear gloves to special occasions. And mm -hmm. her white gloves were, church gloves were dirty. So she wore her funeral gloves. Uh -huh. So she raised her hand. And I said, so did you think Godot was coming? She said, no. And she sounded so positive. I said, how did you know that? She said, I looked in the program and his name wasn't listed. <laughs> now, I don't think that Samuel Beckett thought about that. <laughs> and that's the way they saw everything. They looked at it, they looked at it on its face, what they perceived, and then tried to relate it to their life, which is, of course, what you should do in the theater. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, it's funny, I could, you could ask me the same question because I read the, the book. Yeah. And, and, I, and it was, I had this funny experience, which you could relate to, which it was like, I really want them to come. 
and it's kind of annoying me that he's not coming. <laughs> and at the end, I was like, right, of course, of course he, he had to not come. Well, the interesting <laughs> thing about that play is that everything that happens in that play is real. Mm -hmm. Those two guys, whatever they were, if they were homosexuals, if they were Jews, if they were had political opinions, were had to leave Paris when the Nazis came in. And so they migrated to the Vichy South. And of course, the Vichy South would have turned them in and they'd have wound up in the concentration camps for whatever reason. And so they lived on the road, eating whatever they could find without, they didn't know how to relate to the nothingness they had grown up in Paris. And so they're trying to think their life is threatened. They think the end is coming and they think that somebody will save them, that there's a farmer somewhere named Gatto who will take them in and they will be able to sleep safely without being attacked by some of the Vichy goons. So although Beckett doesn't say this, that play is absolutely a real, realistic play about the condition that happened, the, uh, the st very strange uh, world of uh, France in the Second World War. You know, in common, uh, I mean, in current political parlance, uh, you could have renamed it Waiting for Obama. <laughs> that didn't, he didn't come either. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's exactly right, right? That savior didn't, didn't wind up saving us no. either. So, um, but before I leave your past, uh, real quick, uh, your, your father was on the, was blacklisted yeah. in the McCarthy era? Yeah. So he was also actor and director. He was a, mostly a director. He didn't he didn't act in pictures. He had acted in the theater. Uh, mm -hmm. I think he did. He played John Brown. He did a version called Abe Lincoln in Illinois, mm -hmm. with uh, Ray Massey, and he played John Brown. Mm -hmm. But mostly he was a director. He was one of the first presidents of the Screen Directors Guild, and he was called in because uh, Adolf Maju, who had been to a party at the house, heard him. Uh, Rec, uh, supporting uh, the people from the Moscow Art Theater who were at the party about how they dealt with young actors, how they sent them out into the provinces. So as they worked their way into Moscow, the provinces got the best young actors. But by the time they came to Moscow, they, were no they weren't overwhelmed. He said, mm -hmm. that's the way it should be. What do we do? We take the best and the brightest. We bring them to Hollywood or into New York. Mm -hmm. We use them for a season or two. They're completely overwhelmed by mm -hmm. the intensity of the business and they quit. Mm -hmm. And on the basis of that, my father opened Life magazine. He had a house in Oregon, and there was a sequential uh, set of pictures, a banner across the top, both pages. Adolf Maju testifies before the House and American Activities Committee that the biggest communist in all of Hollywood is John Cromwell. Now, Adolf <laughs> Maju didn't care. What he had to do, the HUAC had been before, and they wanted names now. So if you wanted to get in the headlines and score brownie points with Sam Fuller and all of, and Montgomery and all those people. You had to come up with somebody. So Anif Maja thought, eh, it's not gonna cost me, I'm not gonna work with John anyway, so why not feed him John? So he went and testified at the same session as Bertolt Brecht, who was the only real communist they ever had, and who was so crafty that they gave him a commendation for his cooperation. And he walked right out of the building, it got in a cab, went to the airport and flew to East Berlin. So my father, uh, my father, a wonderful agent named Sam Jaffe who said, uh, they came to him and said, listen, there's nothing wrong with John, we just want him to come in and apologize. And Sam said, John Cromwell's not gonna apologize for anything. So he had signed a million dollar contract with RKO under Dory Sherry. Wow, a million dollar contract back then? Back then. Wow. Uh -huh. And Howard Hughes bought RKO. Uh -huh. So Howard Hughes was a violent anti-communist. So mm -hmm. he gave my father a picture to direct called I Married a Communist, which was a piece of crap. Uh -huh. And so my <laughs> father, knowing what he was doing, said, listen, I'll direct it, but you gotta rewrite the script. I can't shoot what you've given me. Uh -huh. So they got writer after writer after writer, and they couldn't fix the script until they were gonna have to pay him double. Uh -huh. And he, Howard Hughes gave him a million dollars. He bought a building in Beverly Hills. Went to New York and won a Tony with a play with Henry Fonda called uh, Point of No Return, but J.P. Oh. Marquand. Well, God bless, okay. So it doesn't back down and got the million bucks anyway. And got the million bucks. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he was, listen, a lot of people were really hurt by it, so I don't mean to minimize it in any way. Right. Uh, my father was just so uh, 
disgusted with this place that he said, I'll never go back. And he never did until the very end of his life, he came back. Hmm. Okay, so uh, be, before I go back into politics, uh, so you've acted your whole life. Do you love it? <laughs> uh, yeah, you got a wife? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, you. it's your life. Uh, it's, give, there's, it's an extraordinary life. Um, it's a very delicate art. Um, acting, to just be there, to just be present, out of your head, out of your judgments. Mm -hmm. It is a metaphor for the way one has to live life. Mm -hmm. uh, the more you understand that and the more you relax into that, the more the audience gets that you're really there, mm -hmm. uh, that that's you. Um, I never do anything, I, I'm a character actor. Uh, but I never do anything. I never don't do makeups. I don't do voices. Mm -hmm. And yet, people, they see me. They know that I'm playing like a leading actor because a leading actor, Brad Pitt's always Brad Pitt. Mm -hmm. But well, he's not. He's, he does a lot of wonderful character work. But the mm -hmm. leading man is the leading man. Mm -hmm. But they say, you know, they see me and they understand. It's an aspect of me. It's not all of me. If I'm if I'm Captain Dudley, that's not me. They get that and they are able to see me under the character, but it doesn't violate the character. I'm not commenting on the character. So, yeah, I, yes, I love it. Um, it terrifies me sometimes. Uh, uh, it, I'm, I'm also, almost always disappointed uh, in myself. Um, mm. uh, it's never, as Gully Jimson uh, in Joyce Carey's book, you know, he, he, he says it's never the same as it is in my mind when he tries to paint on the wall. It, uh -huh. it just never turns out the same way. So really, in all those great, great performances, you look at them and you're like, ah, no, didn't, didn't get it quite right. I didn't, I, I missed, I will see a flinch, I will know a flinch. They're never quite as apparent once I see the film, once it's done. But when I'm in the moment and I'm doing the scene, I know I've missed it. Mm -hmm. Then a director, of course, takes it and molds it in a different way and contextualizes it and that changes the, it's not, it's not the performance I experienced, it's the performance he created. Hmm, that's interesting, that's a nice ode to directors actually. Yeah. Um, and and uh, you say terrified, terrified of what? That's a good question. Um, of not living up to somebody's expectations, which I suppose were my father's expectations, but now I've internalized them in their mind. Mm -hmm. um, my, my teacher, uh, Milton Katsalas, used to call it a flinch. It's when uh, I did a, a movie with Tom Hanks uh, called The Green Mile, and I misinterpreted a scene. Tom knew, he didn't tell me, uh, and I couldn't deliver what I wanted to deliver. I wanted to break with the camera right on my face. I just wanted it to, to fall to pieces. But it was not right for the scene, and I couldn't get it. And the director, sweet director, tried everything to get me in the scene. But so what I would do is I would duck. I drop my head and my eyes so you couldn't see me. Which when in filmically a director has to cut away then because the audience has no longer has contact with that actor. And go to an actor in which the face is expressive so that the story continues to be told. And that's a flinch. And those things really, they really gnaw at you. Why? I know what I did, uh, mm -hmm. I just, my ego got the better of me and I thought, geez, if I do this right, I could get another nomination. <laughs> and that's a really bad way to approach a part. That's so interesting, I think it's so true for uh, for every profession, right? That, uh, and I don't know, and I think that's probably what drove you to be a really great actor, is that you, you don't wanna disappoint, whether it was your dad initially or yourself and- And them. Yeah. All the people who count on me to show up and not just phone it in and not do something cliche, but actually I believe in what Shakespeare said. The, the purpose of acting is to hold as twere the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time his form and pressure. We are the mirror of humanity in which they see themselves and can then modify what they do and how they feel and become more conscious and more alive and more caring. That's, our, that's what we do it for. 
So that's the craft. Now let me build a bridge back to politics. Yeah. So I hear all the time on Fox News that Hollywood is nothing but liberals. Now you are liberal, right? No, I'm well, a progressive. Fan. Progressive, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we, we can get into that yeah. distinction. Okay. I think there's a distinction yeah, too. too, but but everybody's got a little bit different definition. Yeah. Anyway, but what do you think? Is is Hollywood actually liberal or no? No. Okay, why not? Uh, if there is a politic, the politic is money. And in this country, the money is on the right. Money rules, money talks, um, you're as good as your last picture. I don't care what your politics are. Uh, somebody, some people are gonna agree with your politics, other people are going to despise them. Uh, you're gonna get a job because you put butts in the seat. You put butts in the seat, you get a job, you're interviewed, you can have a point of view. Do not have a point of view that affects your ability to, to attract an audience. If you take a position that alienates any part of this country, they will tell you to stop mm -hmm. in no uncertain terms. Hmm. So did that ever happen to you? Didn't happen to me because no one ever took me seriously enough because I'm sort of that guy, I'm, I'm a character actor, what does it mean? I have taken positions all my life, I flinched once. Uh, the people who were trying to protect the Biona wetlands asked me to come down and see the wetlands and tell they wanted to show me you know, what was being lost. And basically because Spielberg wanted to build his studio on the Biona wetlands because it was a shorter helicopter flight from there to LAX than from his in, at Universal. And I went down and I was really impressed with them and I loved it. Uh, and I said, yeah, I'll do it. And my then wife, um, said was very disappointed with me and talked to a friend of hers, Richard Dreyfus, and he he called me up. He said, Listen, Jamie, there's there's no such thing as a blacklist anymore. But do you think when your name comes up uh, you know, over at DreamWorks that somebody's not gonna say, Jamie Cromwell, is that the schmuck who's keeping us from being able to build? And I thought Wow, I'm really gonna put my career in jeopardy if I do this. And I got three kids, four actually, and all this. So I told the people, listen, I will march, I will give you money, I'll do anything, but you, I can't be the poster boy because it's too much. And I think, oh, two days later, I see a film clip, and who is chained to a chain link fence? Martin Sheehan. Uh huh. And I thought, I, oh, I, I will never do that again. I'll never flinch. That way, Martin doesn't give a damn. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah, no, no, no he yeah. didn't. So, and I realized it doesn't really matter. It's it's better to do the thing and take what comes out of that. And you change, you know. Maybe you don't get the big Hollywood pictures. Maybe I do independent pictures. I never know that whether it's because Hollywood thinks he's got too much baggage. Uh, he's too well known. He's too outspoken. If he's in our picture, he's going to in an interview. He's going to say something about Trump, or he's going <laughs> to say something about. Fossil fuels or whatever, right. and so they don't do it. So, but I have had a very sweet career doing independent films, and th things get smaller and smaller. Now, as you get older and older, there are fewer and fewer parts. But I don't regret. Don't, that's the only thing that I regret that I did not support that organization. Yeah, you know, you keep saying character actor and small roles and stuff, but I, I, I wonder. Like, so you to to me, you're enormously recognizable because you were in I don't know. 20 different things that I have watched, yeah. right? Yeah. So do you get, just random curiosity, do you get recognized all the time or? or I get recognized just enough. Uh -huh. People say to me, I like your work or I love your work. Mm -hmm. And some people say, go so far as to say, you know, whenever I see your name in a picture, I know I wanna see the picture because I know the picture is gonna be good. Mm -hmm. And I get it just enough so that I can disappear in a crowd in New York. I cannot get hassled. I, nobody stops to turn around or very, very freak infrequently. I can take my wife out to dinner. So I don't have all the burdens of celebrity on me, but I get acknowledged for not for my celebrity, but for the work that I do, which is very uh, touching to me. Yeah, no, that, that you found the sweet spot. I did. You did because, and, and you, you play those roles and you play them great, and, and it makes people who enjoy acting and the craft appreciate you. It's, yeah. it's nearly perfect. So nice job. Nearly perfect. <laughs> so now back to politics. Yeah. So uh, 
What was this thing that you, you got arrested for recently that you just had the trial for? I live in a small farming community in the Hudson Valley, which is about an hour and 40 minutes out of New York. It's a farming community, it's zoned, it's a green zone, little houses, one, it's, it's the black dirt region. So they have this incredible black dirt, pitch black, where they grow the onions for New York and a lot of different places. And the, um, the powers that be in their infinite wisdom decided to put a 650 megawatt frack gas power plant there. Uh, about the time that the movement was beginning to ban fracking in New York. Uh, this plant uh, was uh, through uh, graft and corruption uh, and the misinforming and not informing the public as to what was at stake. Um, licensed and went ahead and was built. And I believe there was a quid pro quo with the big greens that they would not oppose this power plant. It had something to do with Cuomo's wish to, de to, to decommission Indian Point, And he wanted to prove to the business community that he would supply them with, we don't use, but 43% of the available electricity in New York anyway. So you didn't need the plant. My, so we tried everything. We have demonstrated, we have a picket, which happens every Saturday. We have about 50 people out there with signs. We went to the governor's office. We presented all material to him. We held press conferences in, in uh, uh, Albany, uh, demonstrations in Albany, everything that we could possibly do. We can't get it in the local papers. We can't get it in the papers of record, the New York Times. Nobody is interested and the big greens will do nothing to support this because there was a quid pro quo. They wanted a ban, it isn't a ban, it's a moratorium on fracking in New York because of the devastation that it's done in Eastern Pennsylvania. And he said, what's in it for, I'm making this up. He said, what's in it for me? And they said, well, okay, so you get to, you get to be an environmental hero for, for instituting a ban, we'll call it a ban on fracking in New York. And you can use more frack gas and we will say nothing about this CPV power plant. This power plant is as we call it, the head of the snake. It's the justification for the build out of all the hydro fracking infrastructure from the fracking fields through all the pipelines and the metering stations and then finally to the compressor stations and then onto the power plant. Because the purpose of digging that fuel up is, as it is everywhere, is to transport that fuel through pipelines to Canada to liquefy it, to send it to Europe and Asia where they get six times more money for it than they do in the local market. But you can't sell that to the people of New York. I'm gonna take your farm by eminent domain so that I can put a pipeline which will basically destroy your cattle herd and, and, and destroy, your, destroy it unless you can justify it that we are developing New York. So that is supposedly the rubric. New York is being developed for, for industry. It's now, our area is now a brown zone because we now have this big power plant. So now we're getting Legoland in um, and the governor can be passed off by the big greens as an environmental hero who instituted the, and this wonderful new bill called New York Renews, which is a crock which is simply to allow the big greens to say, we are not a lily white movement. We have environmental justice community supporters, we have labor union supporters, and we are going to handle the emissions in New York from the fugitive methane and CO2 emissions. And it's not true, and it's not in the bill. And we analyzed it, and all the big greens, we went to them and said, uh, this is what's wrong with the bill. Oh yeah, yeah, we'll change it. At the meantime, they, all they were doing was collecting signatures on the bill. I, this is a break. So we finally said, look, there's nothing else we can do to get attention, but to do an act of civil disobedience, which we did. We locked ourselves together in front of the entrance and supposedly blocked traffic on Route 6. Was it, were arrested uh, for disorderly conduct or blocking traffic or whatever, um, and tried in a small court by a local judge who allowed us the necessity defense. The necessity defense is that the evil that you are opposing is a greater endangerment than the evil caused by your breaking a, the statute that you have broken. And you must prove 
that there was an imminent danger and that you had expended every effort that is available to a citizen to be heard and have an effect. There is no interface anymore in this country between individual citizens or groups of citizens and the government. It takes big NGOs to even get in the door. But when you do civil disobedience, of course, now you attract attention. People have, they want to stick a mic, why did you do this? What is CPV? What, will, what, is, what is the impact that it will have on the environment? I believe the fossil fuel industry will kill every living thing on this planet if given the opportunity, and they are doing it now. Tony and Grafia and uh, the other experts that came said, if we do not keep every iota of fossil fuel in the ground starting now, in five to eight years, the feedback loops will have been engaged and we cannot foresee how they will accelerate what is already happening and then it will be too late. Then there's no, there's no remediation. We're not gonna be able to say, holy, New York's, oh gosh, the water's right up in Wall Street, let's fix this. There's not gonna be a fix. Yeah, so if, if you guys went on the necessity defense, yeah. that could be a really interesting precedent. It is, it's, it does set precedence and it forms the basis of a rationale to oppose extradition, you know, sending people back, cutting off benefits and as far as the healthcare. In other words, in every area one can say, there is an imminent evil to people's lives that we have addressed with civil disobedience. And that should supersede the law that we have broken. So connecting your, the, the, your origin story from back in 1963 to, mm -hmm. to now. Yeah. Uh, and and the through line of that is the civil disobedience to do what is right, correct, uh, and not what's easy. That's what our lawyer Michael Sussman said. He said it's very analogous to the uh, civil rights movement because the civil rights movement didn't begin in '63. It began even back in the '30s. Mm -hmm. It just what happened was under Jim Crow. It didn't matter if you had a rationale like our the Black Water Fountain has been broken for a month. Mm -hmm. So there's no water and I, I, I needed a drink. If you broke that law, if you drank from the fountain that you weren't supposed to drink from, you were guilty. I don't care what your reason, just like uh, the guy who, uh, the one who, who, who uh, about the guy in the truck who was gonna freeze to death. Oh well, yeah, that's yeah, the, the Supreme Gorsuch Court just, case. Yes, yeah. Gorsuch case. And so, you know, it's the same thing, it's that thinking, it doesn't matter. Um, and what your justification is. Well, of course, now it does matter. Ultimately, it mattered then, but now this is a matter of our survival, not, not just our rights, our survival. You said the big greens, yeah. uh, the people at home might not know who, who you're referring to. I'm talking about the uh, um, Sierra, Sierra Club, uh, the NRDC, um, River Keepers, Catskill Mountain Keepers, uh, these organizations, and I understand that they have access. They have access because they have a membership and they have a certain kind of, they have a clout and they have an agenda. And so they use the access available to them and they play the language of the party that they are addressing because they need the quid pro quo to be able to say to their membership, we got you a ban. That's what's important, not the little, and we said, no community should be sacrificed. Just don't say, just because the people in this in Middletown who live in an environmental justice community don't have any clout and don't know what the ramifications of this plan are, don't sacrifice them because you think there's a larger issue about protecting New York from the, the, the evils of fracking. So now we're back to the another part of the earlier part of the interview, which is Vichy France. Now yeah. I don't I don't mean to draw a direct analogy. I think that's too harsh, but uh, but access is a much greater evil than people realize. I agree. And so when I was on television, they always wanted to have politicians on the shows on MSNBC, and I kept asking why. Nobody really likes politicians. You know, <laughs> they're boring. They do talking points. <laughs> it, no, it was for the access. And yeah, uh, that's right. And then if you want that access, then you're gonna have to play ball. Correct. Because when I started insulting the politicians, 
I was given a speech. We don't do that. Why don't we do that? The people don't like politicians. Wouldn't it get you better ratings? And besides which they more than earned it. That's the real reason I was doing it. But yeah. but it would also help in ratings. No, because the reason is they need access. Sure. So once you need access, whether it's for celebrities or sports figures or politicians, well, then you're gonna warp what you're doing correct. to accommodate the occupying power. That's correct. And so the occupying power is the is the donor class that has captured the politicians, which then require a certain, you know, etiquette to gain access to them. Correct. And hence why a lot of well-meaning big progressive groups in Washington and other places have become occupied yeah. by their obsession with access. And also to a great degree, to my mind, the corporate media, because the corporate media plays at a stage in which there is a there's a, um, a benefit to be earned from kowtowing and, and slanting the story. How does Judith Miller get away with what she got? Wasn't Judith Miller yes, at the yep, Times? Yep, yep. How, you know, because she's in, she sits in the front row, because she knows what she will get the information to be able to write the column. Suppose, she doesn't care whether it's actually truth or not. She cares because she wants her byline on the front page of the New York Times, That's right? And they they take advantage of it. And it's and you know it's it's always worse than you think it is, right? Like <laughs> like when we were growing up and we thought the cops and prosecutors don't lie, right? So because the New York Times actually had very good articles back then about how Iraq was not connected to 9/11, uh -huh. right? And some even questioning the weapons of mass destruction, but they were buried in A27 of the paper yeah. because those. Writers did a great job of unearthing that evidence without access. Right. The people with access wound up on page one. Correct. So right or wrong, access matters more than facts, right? Yeah. And so that's what warps all of the things that, that, that we see here. But look, I I think we're trying to do things differently, right? I know you are. So, yeah, so whether it's young that's why you That's why you are where you are. Uh, people listen to that, it, it's qualitatively different. Because you have an opinion and you express your opinion, and people see it's uh, it's uh, deeply felt, it's reasoned, uh, it's not uh, knee jerk, um, and that's uh, it's rare. Yeah, thank you. And and for the and I started two packs, Wolf Pack to get money out of politics, mm -hmm. and I helped to start Just Democrats, which is the progressive strong wing mm -hmm. of Democratic. People make the mistake of thinking that we're that it's more liberal or more progressive. Etc. Sure, it's very progressive, just Democrats are. But more than that, it's strong. And by, by strong, it means we're not gonna count out for access, right? We're not going to say, hey, you know, well, okay, let's go along to get along, etc. Mm -hmm. And and so I think that, that that could make all the difference. We'll see. So is your sense that there is a possibility that there would be a Democratic Party which would actually have a progressive agenda and would reach enough people in the United States so that this binary system of Republican Democrat would actually stand for two opposing points of view. Instead of the controlled opposition for that's the corporatists. Correct. That's right. right. That's you exactly right. And, and you I, believe it's possible. I definitely think it's possible, partly because of, again, history. So FDR, uh, so security, um, and and created incredible economic boom. Now, we didn't always do what was right. Certainly, internally or externally, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ups and downs in that history. Uh, I mean, the best example, of course, is is Lyndon Johnson. Uh, did the Vietnam War is an absolute disaster, foreign policy mm -hmm. wise. Went along with all of the you know, the coups and everything else that that the CIA was doing nonstop uh, at at the time. He got played. Yeah, but domestically, great society, well, yeah, very important. You know. Uh, Medicaid, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. And so there was a time when there were real progressives, they were in the Democratic Party and they did get things done. True. Right? Yeah. And and all the way up to 78, when Ralph Nader, and I've had Ralph Nader sit there and, and I've asked him, uh, all the way up to 1978, he's winning. He got Nixon to pass the EPA. I mean, we forget Nixon passed the EPA because mm -hmm. he was so scared of Ralph Nader. That seems like a totally different planet today, yeah. right? Yeah. But but and I asked Nader well, what changed in '78, and he said the Democratic Party realized they could take corporate money too. Yep. And then it was done. And then there was no more progress. There was no more progressives. Yeah. And so, for just Democrats, the idea is don't take corporate money. 
Don't was, take PACs money. Bernie, what how Bernie did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Bernie showed the way. Because that's I, why they're so scared of him. I supported Dennis Kucinich uh, uh, every time he ran. Uh -huh. And the, one of the first times he ran, when we went to the convention, Kerry's people wanted to see his speech beforehand, and Dennis refused. He said, I'll go home. Mm -hmm. uh, don't tell me what to say. And yeah. of course, they put him on at nine o'clock in the morning when the, when the hall was empty. Nobody ever heard his speech <laughs> anyway. And then the, the second time, the same thing happened. Well, it happened when, when he refused to support Obamacare. And Obama called him up and said, I'm going to Cleveland on Air Force One. You will be on the plane and you will stand next to me on the platform and you will say nice things about this. Otherwise, you won't have a, 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 a district, which is basically what the party did to him. That's exactly they, what happened. Yeah, actually. they pulled the pull his district away from him. Yeah, and they, they put it in uh, another district that was uh, had another very progressive member. And well, she's not so progressive. <laughs> but I, I hear you. I hear you. But but he got played. There. He got played. Yeah, uh, because that's what power does. Yeah, that's what always concerns me. We get we elect wonderful people, but but. Power, you know, the power doesn't reside in the people that we elect. I don't care how progressive they are. The power resides in the cokes and the and. So that's the thesis there. I want to get back to your trial in a second, but just to yeah, finish the sure. thought. Uh, yeah, if the if we take only small donors, then that's where our power resides. Chris, and so then our power resides in the voters, and I think that that yep. is going to be more powerful it than is. they realize. I agree. Yeah. So, uh, when is the verdict? When do we? When it's when? up to the, it's up to the judge. What they do is he he keeps it close to the vest. He's probably vetting it in people who have a vested interest in this. The local community has a great deal to gain by this plant finally opening and paying taxes and building schools and do whatever. Uh, and he wants to be able to frame it in such a way that we are not able to take advantage of it. Should he? Uh, um, judge against us, uh, but if he listened and he and he looked like he was listening, he must understand what's at stake and that he could become one of the great jurists by by saying no. Now is the time that we must use every uh, option in order to address the largest evil that humanity has ever faced, which is its its own destruction by its own hand. And and if you guys lose, do you get jail time? Do you know? No, no, probably pay a fine. There's no, there's no, they don't care. What they will do is they will enjoin us from ever doing it again, or for a certain period of time. The local newspaper will say, "Ah, oh, they were guilty. They were found guilty." Blah blah blah. And it dis, it, they want it to go away. Mm -hmm. Of course, this issue is not going to go away. This issue is going to get worse and worse. So we're it's we're we're always trying to push this forward. And not get dispirited by the fact that it doesn't move as quickly as we know it has to move. So, you you think that the climate change is going to happen a lot quicker than conventional wisdom? Uh, I don't know, but I accept uh, Bob Howarth and T Tony and Graffia, and they know from Cornell. They know as climate scientists what's happening. Everything that I read, I read you know, things out of Truth Dig and, and climate scientists are saying, geez, we never thought it would go this fast. We never thought the polar ice cap would go that fast, that there would be a possibility that all the methane that's trapped in that ice is going to be released and that the heating of the oceans is accelerated as the ice cap shrinks because there's more blue water and that that is changing along with the acidity and that's going to affect the Gulf Stream. And if that changes and should happen to reverse itself, we're gonna be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, does that leave you pessimistic about mankind that we're, we're gonna somehow find a way to destroy ourselves? Uh, or do you still hold on to optimism and think that we're gonna figure it out, we're gonna survive? What's your take on, okay, on that? Look, we got, I have children, you have children. We love this life, life and the one and the, and the miracle of life. And so you have to continue to fight for uh, the benefit of everyone, uh, for, for, for justice, for peace. You have to fight for these things. On the other hand, metaphorically, as a human being, there is an end. So we'd 
we don't like to think about that. We don't like to think that we're going to walk into a doctor's office at some point. He's going to say, you have an inoperable tumor. And I'm sorry. There's really nothing we can do. We'll feed you full of poison for a little while, but you're going to die anyway. That then gives you a certain amount of time to accept your own personal mortality and look at your life and do the things that are on your bucket list, whatever is available. We do not think, we do not like to think that that's possible for a species. I don't suppose the dinosaurs thought about it either. They went ahead, looked off, everything looked fine for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then suddenly something changes. I think that happens all the time. This may be an experiment for whatever put it in motion that has failed, that we are not wise enough, that we never got to the point where we made the nef next evolutionary step, which is to be able to perceive our, each other through the heart, through empathy, so that there is no lying, there is no aggression, there's no hiding. We're all transparent to each other. And so we, we realize we are all one consciousness and we have to embrace everybody. We have to lift everybody. That we didn't get to, we missed it. They, all the teachers, Jesus, Buddha, they all told us, that's why you're here, schmuck. The Taoists, the Sufis, that's the Transcendentalists. Correct. Bless their hearts, every one of every the teachers. Every one of them, yes. All say the same things. Yes, well, I am an eternal optimist. So I believe we're gonna turn the corner. <laughs> good on you, that's good. <laughs> so, that's what keeps you going. Yeah, I hope that I'm not waiting for Godot. <laughs> well. Persist and persevere, yeah. and uh, and we'll see. Yes, and Mark Twain said change happens really gradually and all of a sudden. Yeah. And so that could be the change like the dinosaurs got, yeah. or maybe it's change in the opposite direction. I, I would believe it with all my heart. The next evolutionary change might happen, you know, many people have theories that it, it happened because what we ingest when we changed our diet. So there, it may be that some microbe somewhere that is activated because of global warming will go into and change brain chemistry. And brain chemistry will change overnight, like an enlightenment experience, but happening in over the entirety of the globe, in which people finally wake up and say, oh shit, it's not about the money, it's about us. Uh, I like that movie, and I'd like to cast you in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to be in that movie. <laughs> Jamie Cromwell, thank you so much for joining us on The Actors. Really pleasure. appreciate Thank it. you, man. <laughs>